thank you to the Haven Center uh, for what has been a lovely time. Um, Y'all are a great community. Uh, this is my second uh, time spending time in this community. I was here last year around this time doing some work with the First Wave program. Uh, so it looks like uh, Madison is becoming a uh, part of my extended academic family and um, I appreciate that. And so thank you so much, Patrick, uh, Myra. Uh, thank you all for, for this time. Um, so despite the title of this talk, uh, I'm not actually going to try to convince you that black lives matter. I'm going to start from the very basic premise that black lives matter. That we as a nation must perennially reckon with the veracity of such a basic declaration is the kind of truth that could make any one of us divest all sense of hope or belief in America as a land of liberty and justice for all. There's a fundamental tension between what we say and believe to be true about ourselves as a nation and what is actually true based upon how the nation state treats its citizens. I suppose that is a fundamental condition of human beings too, that there's a difference between what we say to be true and what is actually true. I also hope that you will indulge me in this talk as I tack back and forth between the self-reflective, the theoretical and academic, the popular and at times the sermonic. As I lay out the cultural landscape, I'm attempting to steer us, particularly on a day like today, when we've got to get out in the streets again because another young black man's life was deemed not worthy of protection. So on a day like today, I'm attempting to steer us to a clearer field of vision, to land us in a place where we sense, if not clear answers, since I don't think it's up to any one person to assert clear answers here, then certainly to a real notion of critical possibility. As the bodies continue to pile up, this week in your town, Anthony Robinson and in Atlanta, this past Monday, Anthony Hill, we simply cannot expend our time making the case that black people should be able to move about the world breathing freely, walking through their neighborhoods with their friends without worrying about their proximity to the sidewalk, sitting in the park waiting on one's big sister while playing with a pellet gun, Little boys down south, where I'm from, play with pellet guns all the time. Or experiencing mental illness without threat of being killed. So I want to think through with you some of the questions that I've been thinking about as we attempt to organize a gender-inclusive racial justice framework and movement befitting of the 21st century. So I want to begin in a different place. And frequently the place that I begin is in pop culture because I like it. Uh, and so I want to begin with one of my minor obsessions. Law and Order. <laughs> law and Order, and particularly SVU. Now the Law and Order franchise has been on television in one form or another since 1990. Literally over two-thirds of my life. And on this particular episode that I want to talk about, Detective Olivia Vincent, pictured here by Mariska Hargitay, uh, confronts a father and husband played by Blair Underwood, who is uh, second to your right, um, turned stalker and domestic abuser. During the confrontation, his character pulls a knife, and it's unclear what he's going to do with it, whether use it on himself or lunge at other officers. It is clear that his knife is no match for Olivia Benson's gun. And so as I watched this episode, I thought of the story of Kahimi Powell, a 25-year-old black man killed just 10 days after Michael Brown in St. Louis while he was pacing back and forth in front of a convenience store holding a knife. And Kahimi Powell has a history of mental illness uh, and, and, again, was holding a knife but didn't approach or lunge at officers, as far as I understand. So back on Law & Order, I watched in horror as Olivia, with gun drawn, began to shoot. And I wondered why she would dare shoot a man who had a knife when she had a gun. Luckily for the troubled man, the bullets were rubber bullets in the episode, and they had been used merely to disarm him. And I was convinced in that moment of several things. One, in real life it doesn't go down this way. Kahimi Powell and now, this past Monday, Anthony Hill in Atlanta, a black man suffering from, or both young men with histories of mental illness. Anthony Hill clearly unarmed because he was naked. 
remind us that most officers are taught to shoot to kill. We must ask why this has become our culture of policing. Why do officers frequently escalate the violence in a situation rather than de-escalating it or diffusing tensions? Why is there a different standard of policing in white communities and another standard of policing in black and Latino communities? Why is the mantra of policing in white communities protect and serve, and in black and brown communities it is kill or be killed? And how does our cultural obsession with crime procedurals like law and order both scripted and reality versions, because y'all know you watch 48 Hours or, you know, or another 48, et cetera, impact our view of policing. On most network shows, we come away with the overarching belief that at the end of the day, the police are the good guys. When they bend and break rules, they do it in service of justice and to protect victims. These shows help us to buy into the belief that the bending and breaking of rules by law enforcement is what Giorgio Agamben has called the, quote, state of exception by which he refers in its most basic form to the suspension of law itself, but that matters politically for us because, quote, the state of exception appears as a threshold of indeterminacy between democracy and absolutism. And so I would add that it seems to be that black bodies are the bodies that demarcate the threshold of democracy and absolutism in the Agamben theorized state of exception. So how does a steady diet of whodunit solved by every single facet of law enforcement Military police, military lawyers, the NYPD, the LAPD, the Chicago PD, the Detroit PD, the Philly PD, those are all shows, right? Et cetera, et cetera, participate in fashioning us as a certain kind of compliant citizen while simultaneously normalizing a nascent police state that operates as a quotidian matter in the state of exception. Are these shows merely state propaganda? Now here's the thing. I'm not going to go that far, because I'm not going to give up law and order. <laughs> <laughs> or Scandal, or NCIS, or How to Get Away with Murder. Any, all of those are my shows. Those are the shows I watch. I'm not giving them up. But I do think we can have a critical orientation about what they are asking us to believe. right? And if they are asking us to suspend disbelief, then, th then that too, that orientation, if we're, we understand it, means that we don't actually believe the world works this way. That cop, we don't actually believe cops are good people in this way. Or that they're the good guys. I should say they may be good people, but they're not necessarily the good guys. So then, we should recognize that our collective view of the police is mediated through the narratives by which we access these shows. For instance, how many people wanted to become a, an attorney because of watching shows like this on TV growing up? Anybody? want to become an attorney because you watched, I mean, I watched Matt Lock. I grew up watching Matt Lock because I'm a 90s kid. You know, he was great. Um, and so, you know, it was a thing where I thought that that might be something I wanted to do. So even the way we listen to and analyze evidence in contemporary news stories where we want to see autopsy drawings, we want to know what's happening with DNA, do you have fingerprints, is mediated by the fact that CSI has been on the air for over a decade. We didn't think about our own relationship to crime until we started seeing it popularized in a show like CSI. So these things have entirely shifted how we relate to the criminal justice system, even though we don't know it. And just as a related example, if you don't believe me, let's take something entirely farther afield, like the Food Network or the Cooking Channel, which I also love. <laughs> now, these days I eat a lot of quinoa for breakfast because it has protein and I'm trying to watch my carbs, et cetera, et cetera. Well, in 2003, I didn't know what quinoa was. I learned what it was when I watched Rachel Ray going on a trip where she eats food, because we do watch the TV so we can watch other people eat, which is like completely bizarre. <laughs> but what Food Network and the Cooking Channel have entirely done is they've turned a significant swath of Americans, me included, into food snobs. <laughs> they have entirely shifted the culture of what you can get at the grocery store, how you relate to how your food is described, uh, and, and all the kinds of foods that we eat. So, popular culture and what we consume on television does actually shape how we relate to the broader world. It participates fundamentally, popular culture I mean, in the project of what Louis Althusser would call interpolating us as citizens within a body politic. 
And for me, the question is, what kind of citizens are being called into existence in the mediated forms of reality and ideology that determine how we view the state apparatus? For instance, we have lots of shows which dramatize for us the fundamental importance of existing state apparatuses, from the presidency on down to the FBI, the CIA, and more recently, the Department of State. And we have to take that and, and pair that against the last few months of 2014, where we witnessed a procession of horrific crimes committed by police that in many instances were completely unprosecuted. So there was Kahimi Powell, and then there was Eric Garner, July 17th, 2014, Staten Island, John Crawford, August 5th, 2014, Beaver Creek, Ohio, Michael Brown Jr., August 9th, 2014, Ferguson, Missouri, Kahimi Powell was next on August 19th. Then Shanique Proctor, November 1st, 2014, Bessemer, Alabama. Tanisha Anderson, November 13th, 2014, Cleveland, Ohio. Akai Gurley, November 20th, 2014, Brooklyn, New York. Tamir Rice, November 22nd, 2014, Cleveland, Ohio. And he was only 12. And these are all police shootings of unarmed people. And then the last week we had Tony Robinson, March 6, 2015, Madison, Wisconsin, and Anthony Ant Hill, March 9, 2015, Atlanta, Georgia. The unjust police killings of all these unarmed black people stands in stark contrast to the existing law and order narrative that frame our popular narrative of the police as almost always good and citizens or, or as good until they aren't. So I wanted to begin with law and order because it raises for me the question of where we make psychic and cultural space to imagine a new set of relations between citizens and the state, especially because we are so sorely in need in this moment of an ima expanded imaginary as it relates to the ever encroaching march of a police state. Not only do I wonder whether being a Washington narrative to celebrate and glorify the exercise of state power normalized the state of exception, making its functions invisible, but I also wonder about the relationship of Foucauldian notions of biopolitics, or what we might call, to, what Foucault calls to make live and let die, certain populations of people to what Achille Mbembe has called necropolitics. So Foucault argues that in this contemporary arena, we live in a state of biopolitics or the creation of populations where states participate in making certain populations live and letting other populations die. And Achille Mbembe argues that in fact, it is a more active, what we really have is a state of necropolitics in which states let certain groups live and make certain groups die. The proliferation of black death, the state sanctioned killing of black bodies, particularly young black male bodies, and the spectacle of black death made possible by the incessant visuality of social media has disrupted the smooth dysfunction of the existing order. Biopolitics might be considered Foucault's most clear attempt to account for the creation of race and racism as a state-based creation of populations, some of which are valued as populations. But Mbembe asks us to think about what happens when a state actively participates in the killing of whole populations of people, whether in Nazi Germany or in South Africa. And he understands necropolitics as the subjugation of life to the power of death. The result of these politics is the creation of what he calls death worlds, new and unique forms of social existence in which Vast populations are subject to conditions of life conferring upon them the status of the living dead. So now consider, for instance, Mike Brown as paradigmatic of a life lived under the conditions of necropolitics that shape too many black people's relationship to the current state. When Michael Brown and his friends were walking through his neighborhood on August 9th and they encountered Darren Wilson, according to Mike's friend, Wilson yelled at them, get the fuck back up on the sidewalk. Mike refused and kept on walking. A confrontation ensued and Brown ended up dead. Now I won't relitigate all these points of tension, but suffice it to say that most black folks view the grand jury proceedings in the Darren Wilson case as a farce and a sham, not unlike the jury trials of white men uh, in, who in the early 20th century uh, you know, had, had sham trials because they had been accused of killing black people. But what interests me is that Mike Brown's simple refusal to walk on a sidewalk got him killed by a police officer because he was not compliant to the rule of law. 
His willful refusal to comply with the officer's demand, perhaps because he perceived it to be an Ill illegitimate show of force, a power trip, was met with capital punishment. So when we learned that Darren Wilson wouldn't be prosecutor, prosecuted, we were treated over in the ensuing days to hear what Wilson thought of Brown. <clears throat> he called him a demon. He said, it, he said, I quote, it looked like a demon. And he said, he, he characterized him as the Hulk. Brown existed in what Grace Hogg and Orlando, Orlando Patterson and others have termed a state of social death. And that he existed as a person who was not allowed to have a will. If you exercise your will by saying, I don't want to get on the sidewalk and you die, that is a condition of not having a will. Of the state saying you don't actually have the will to assert anything. I'm not saying will means you don't have consequences, but the, if the consequence is death, that's being in a state of anti-will. Hong argues that to be without will, to be foreclosed from the subject position of the possessive individual, is to approximate the condition of social death, which found its most quintessential iteration for black folks in the period of chattel slavery. So Mike Brown's willfulness is met with death, meaning that the perception of him as willful and unwilling to be submissive all at the same time sanctions his murder. And I'm saying that's no way to live. Literally. And because his murdered body was left lying on the street for four hours in a small, insular, contiguous, and closed community, the spectacle of a terrorized black body is also meant to produce pliant black citizens who see clearly the results of failure to submit to the rule of law. A rule of law which in this instance is figured as against the right of black people to have any notion of possessive individualism and any notion of a will. So now, in locales across the country, young people are staging die-ins, stopping traffic, publicly enacting their pain and their grief and their rage. And in your own community on Monday, students took over the state capitol to protest the killing of Tony Robinson. Like Eric Garner's final words, they declare, this ends today, which is the thing that Eric Garner said as he stood on the sidewalk encountering the officers who wanted to arrest him for selling loose cigarettes. He said, this ends today. This ends today. There is, meanwhile, a push for a codified strategy of movement. But I'm firmly of the belief that while that is needed, there is something more than merely cathartic. There is something wholly integral about our country being made witness to black pain black devastation, and black rage. Why are we so uncomfortable with black anger? Especially when we live in a country that does everything to elicit it. Do not human beings feel devastation in the face of injustice, continued injustice? Do they not feel grief? Do they not feel anger and rage? So what happens in a system that produces what Dr. Christy Dotson calls systematic hopelessness? and to which I would add systematic rage, and then refuses its victims any kind of legitimate outlet or, or of expression or remedy for their injury. Is that a humane system? Is that a fundamentally just system? I submit to you the obvious that it's not. In 1977, famous writer and American prophet James Baldwin returned to America after living in France for over three decades. In an interview at the New York Times, he said, I left America because I had to. It was a personal decision. I wanted to write, and it was the 1940s, and there was no big picnic for blacks. I grew up on the streets of Parliament. I remember President Roosevelt, the liberal, having a lot of trouble with an anti-lynching bill he wanted to get through the Congress. Never mind the vote, never mind restaurants, never mind schools, never mind a fair employment policy. I had to leave. I needed to be in a place where I could breathe and not feel someone's hand on my throat. On July 13th, 2014, Eric Garner, Staten Island resident, husband, father, and former city employee, got into an altercation with police over selling loose cigarettes. He was placed in a chokehold where he told officers, I can't breathe, 13 times. Finally, after the incident sent him into cardiac arrest, he lay there dying on the street while emergency medical technicians milled about without offering him any assistance. There is video, but I'm not going to show it. Black death has become too spectacular. The videos are passed around to affirm black people's account of state violence and to compel empathy from white people. But when that empathy is not forthcoming, 
we are given differential access to power and therefore it is disconfirmed what we are saying, we are confronted yet again with our helplessness in the face of such a system. That we could watch a citizen beg the police for his life, have it taken from him for the petty crime of selling untaxed cigarettes, and then go on functioning as usual as the height of dysfunction. There is something uniquely American and uniquely white about the macabre fascination with black suffering and black death. And it is important that we refuse the spectacle. Because what we have learned is our desire to gaze at black bodies from the earliest moments when we gazed upon the bodies of women like Sarah Bartman and Joyce Heth, who was the first uh, exhibit in P.T. Barnum Circus, an 80-year-old black woman that he locked in a cage and people would come by and look at her all day, um, is that the status of the visual as incontestable evidence of black humanity or black claims about brutality is no longer a definitive thing. We watched John Crawford be murdered. We watched Eric Garner be murdered. We watched Tamir Rice be murdered. And all their killers are free. And there is a gendered reason why we need to refuse the spectacle. Because there are deaths in our communities that hide in plain sight. Five transgender black women have been murdered, murdered in 2015. Yasmin Payne, Ty Underwood, Lamia Beard, Lamar Edwards, and Penny Proud. And there are copious stories of intimate partner violence that are disproportionately harmful and or are, and are deadly to cisgender black women in hetero partnerships as well. So we literally were in a position where we were almost having one murder of a trans woman, a trans black woman every week. And have we had any marches and protests, any national outrage? We had a little bit of coverage, a little bit, minuscule. But how is it that these folks are being murdered and nobody feels the need to march on the street for them? Are they not black lives too? So what we must ask is what it will take to stretch our nation to make it truly a home for all of us who choose to inhabit it. We must figure out the places and spaces we make in culture for reimagining the limits and bounds of the nation state. To return to Baldwin's words, I needed to be in a place where I could breathe and not feel someone's hand on my throat. America was not that place for him. And America was not that place for Eric Garner or for Tanisha Anderson or for Shanique Proctor or for Tony Robinson or for Aunt Hill. All of whom died of some kind of violence, police violence. <clears throat> Tony Morrison has argued that home is an idea rather than a place. It's where you feel safe where you are among people who are kind to you. They're not after you. They don't have to like you, but they'll not hurt you. And if you're in trouble, they'll help you. It's community. That's another word for what I've described. We must ask why the refusal of breath has become endemic to the black condition in America. To invoke a title from a movie that is two decades old, <coughs> black folks are always waiting to exhale always stuck in a middle passage somewhere between freedom and death, captivity and fugitivity, never home. We must ask why the freedom to kill black folks at will is endemic and not exceptional. This is not an acceptable 21st century condition, not in a nation that has seen fit to elect a black president. So how do we reconcile these two, that we have Barack Obama and we have Mike Brown and Tamir Rice and Anthony Hill and Tony Robinson? I don't know that we can or that we do. Because up until this weekend, President Obama was still telling us, abide by the rule of law. And that's part of his rhetoric about being the president of all of America, not just black America, right? But what I would submit is, if you're not the president of black America, then you can't claim to be the president of all of America, right? Furthermore, if you can't say that black lives matter without equivocating, then you can't say all lives matter. If saying black lives matter makes you uncomfortable, you don't actually think all lives matter. Now over at, in Selma this weekend, he, he, he walked back some of that rhetoric and finally acknowledged that Ferguson is not, is an, is indexes, indexes a persistent and enduring problem. And he had to do that because the Justice Depart Department report on Ferguson is downright damning. I mean, it's, it is some scary stuff. So here are just some of the things they said. 
Ferguson's law enforcement practices are shaped by the city's focus on revenue rather than by public safety needs. This emphasis on revenue has compromised the institutional character of Ferguson's police department, <laughs> contributing to a pattern of unconstitutional policing. Ferguson's police and municipal court practices both reflect and exacerbate existing racial bias, including racial stereotypes. And Ferguson's own data establish clear racial disparity that adversely impact African Americans. And the evidence shows that discriminatory intent is part of the reason for this, these disparities. Another thing the report said is that, which I wrote about in my column at Salon today, is that the police expect compliance. They expect and demand compliance even when they don't have legal authority to do so. So they view any assertion of one's rights as illegal defiance of their authority. The report actually says this. So they said that when people like ask questions or assert the right to freedom of speech, when they like get belligerent with cops, cops say that that's a denial of their authority and arrest them for disturbing the peace. Yeah. The thing, I'm not shocked I've had a cop do it. He was a black cop. Right? You know, I can arrest you for disturbing the peace. I was like, no, you can't. I know my rights. Try it. Right? But he did put his hand on this billy club to try to irritate, to try to, to try to intimidate me. So this is not just a white black thing. This is part of the culture of policing. Right, that citizens can't assert rights, and when they do, it is seen as defiant. Right? Now, it's mostly a white thing towards black citizens who are over police, but I want to be clear that there's an ideology of policing that doesn't just impact white people. Right? Because anti blackness is not just contained in white bodies. Right? And the mistake many white citizens make is that they think anti blackness can't touch them. And if you live in a world where you let the police run rampant eventually, those billy clubs can touch you too. Right. And I just said the billy clubs, you know, with the bullets and the tasers and the tear gas. Right? Now, let's consider, so that's Ferguson. And that's pretty terrible. We all agree, yes? Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about your own fair city. Now, Madison bears a troubling resemblance to Ferguson. In Dane County, in which this city is the largest city in the county, 2013, arrest rates were 10 times as high here in Fair Madison for black juveniles than white juveniles. For adults, they were 11 times as high. In 2013, black juveniles made up 16.9% of the population, but 70% of the arrest. Black adults make up 5.7% of the population, but account for 42% of all arrests. Black median household income in this county is $20,664, whereas white median household income is $63,673. Now, to put this in perspective, the black median income is $4,000 less than statewide percentages and $13,000 less than national percentages. By contrast, white median incomes are 11,000 more than state percentages in this county and 9,000 more than national percentages. In 2011, 54% of black residents in this county lived in poverty, where only 8.7% of non-Hispanic whites live in poverty. In Ferguson, 53% of their residents live in poverty. So when you wonder, how a Tony Robinson happens, hey, hey. <laughs> I'm glad y'all are here because I want to thank these folks from, from, the, for, um, from your group uh, Young, Gifted, and Black and uh, Freedom Inc. for pipping me to the Race to Equity report uh, because the, the picture is pretty terrible. So when you think about how you get to uh, Ferguson or Madison, it's because you have severe inequality and over-policing. Why, are poli why are, is this community being policed when, they, when adults make up 5.5% of the population here? Right? I mean, that seems like an inequitable distribution of your taxpayer resources, too. <laughs> so, <clears throat> given this picture, and, and, and it reminds me 
business thing I want to tell you about the Ferguson Report too. One of the key reasons why I wanted to put all of this up is because what happened in Ferguson was that black folks in Ferguson were cons considered to be revenue generators for the city. So anytime there was a windfall, I mean a shortfall in, in perceived revenue, then they would try to make it up in tickets. But since they primarily ticket black people, they just ticket them. So one woman that this report cites had spent six days in jail and owed more than $1,000 in fine for one parking ticket that she had not paid. So when she missed the court date for the unpaid parking ticket, then they issued a warrant for her and tacked on additional fines. And then when she tried to pay down the fines in 15 or $20 increments because she had struggled with homelessness, they wouldn't actually take that money. So every time she was late, they just kept tacking on fees. So now she's paid $500 of the parking ticket, which was like $75 or something, or $150, and she still owes $500, and she spent six days in jail. And the supreme irony is that, so this, so, so think about where Ferguson gets a script like that from, that we see black people as revenue generators for the city. That's a really old script. We've always seen black people as revenue generators for the country. Mm -hmm. We primarily think about black people as a form of capital, right? That is the, that's the argument for slavery. You're my property, I own you, I can cash you in, I can get insurance on you, right? So, this, I, so we keep seeing an old script remixed under new terms. So revenue generation is a neoliberal term. Right? Everything, you know, universities are supposed to generate revenue too. Right? Keep on, let me leave that alone. <laughs> <laughs> but this city saw these people as revenue generators and referred to them by that. The other thing that's important about this report is they showed that there wasn't just disparity. disparity disparate impact is enough. Like all I showed you is not intent. I've just showed you disparate numbers, right, in terms of how people live. But what the Ferguson report showed is that there was actual intent to discriminate, which is really egregious because even in the conservative Supreme Court era we live in right now, the Supreme Court primarily just requires evidence of consistent, systematic, disparate impact to find that, that there's racial inequality and it should be ameliorated. So they don't even believe, we don't in our popular discourse believe anymore that white people intend to discriminate, not systematically. And yet here we see a whole community Sending emails back and forth about where, you know, where can we get this money to make up shortfalls in the budget? By ticketing and policing your poorest citizens, your black citizens. And we don't think that kind of stuff happens in 2015. And yet, page after page of this report shows egregious violation after egregious violation. That's all right though. Because we turn it up. <laughs> so part of the work that I've been doing with the Black Lives Matter National Network is to help build a language for a gender inclusive racial justice framework. And so what you need to know is that the Black Lives Matter movement was started after the death of Trayvon Martin and the acquittal of his killer George Zimmerman by three queer black women, mm -hmm. Patrice Cullors, Alicia Garza, and Opal Temet. We're not here doing this work on behalf of young brothers without black women. And frequently we use the hashtag and the banner and we march and we don't even know who laid the groundwork for us to be able to organize under that banner. So you need to know their names. And when you teach about this movement, you need to call their names. It's important. So part of the work, so, so what I, what I want to talk about a bit is what does it mean to build, how do we build a racial justice framework that's inclusive? And I, and I have more questions than answers. And, 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 and I want to be clear that this movement work is really nascent and really new. Um, and that I'm trying to think together with you about how we build, right? Um, and so one of the things to know is that we reject this notion of hierarchical leadership, right? And we have to, ch so in my work, what that means is challenging the politics of racial manhood, uh, which has meant creating a sustainable and healthy model of black, black leadership 
um, that doesn't erase black women's labor and that doesn't demand that black men be in the center of our organizing. So we must refuse to make this moment one which recenters cisgender black men as the only subjects of a, of a black freedom project, which is why it's important that you know these women. And, and when, you, when you wonder what I mean when I say not center black men, I mean we're not fighting for black male liberation. We're fighting for black liberation, right? And so often we continue to think that the Black Freedom Project is about black men. We think black men are the most endangered. We think they're the only victims of state violence. And I've tried to demonstrate in this talk, black women get killed too. And when black women don't get killed by the police, we get viciously beaten. And when we don't get viciously beaten, we get raped. It was a case in Oklahoma of an officer who raped eight black women last year that no one talked about. So this is Kendrick's new cover art. Y'all like Kendrick? I like Kendrick. Kendrick Lamar. This is his new cover art. I want you to look at this cover. It just came out today. I want you to look at the cover. Because this is, a, this is an attempt to make this argument about thuggish, ratchet, black dudes taking over the White House, <laughs> right? T you, know, um, if, you know, invading the nation state, right, is what this is attempting to signify, because the album is fairly political. Now, it tries, so part of what it, it's subversive in that it attempt to resist the idea, it attempts to resist the idea that young black men who sag their pants and drink 40s and throw up the deuces don't have any political consciousness. But the question is, where are the women? So my homeboy, Niall Ford, who's an organizer with Black Lives Matter in New York, posted this and said, look, I want to love Kendrick's new album cover, but where's the sisters, fam? You have a pic of a bunch of black men overthrowing the government without a single black woman. If black women are not a part of your idea of radical resistance, then <clears throat> sexism has corrupted your anti-racism. Please know that that ain't revolution. It's a sexist boys club dressed in revolutionary garb. I don't care how well you rap, you still don't get a pass. We need revolutionary principles, not revolutionary personalities. We can't be truly anti-racist while clinging to sexism. They're part of the same system. When we chant, the whole damn system is guilty as hell, that includes patriarchy and misogyny. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now here's the thing. There's some women in this photo. You have to look real hard to see them. There's like one right here hiding behind this money. <laughs> There's like one right here look like... Uh, yeah, there's one right here. Her face is covered by them. What the hell? <laughs> right? So I want to reiterate now this point. We need revolutionary principles, not revolutionary personalities. So part of the work of Black Lives Matter and the work I do with them is to help us to think about how we, what it means to get free for everybody, for queer black folks, for trans black folks, for black women, for poor black people. Right? Not just for cisgender black men. And that makes brothers uncomfortable. Because they don't have a problem with sisters marching in the street for them. When we start demanding that this is about us too, then it becomes all this him and hell. Well, the cops ain't killing y'all. What you talking about? Yes, they are. And even if they're not, they're killing you and that affects us. Right? Also, another thing that is really important to say in this moment. Part of the work of building this movement is that we got to resist the lure of celebrity. See, one of the things that happens, and, and, and this is why I love Nile. Nile is a dynamo. He's brilliant. He's a preacher. He does the whole thing like one of the most radical preachers I've ever met. Um, and so there, there's a tendency to want to pick out a leader. Like I've had black folks be like, well, who is going to lead us? We all going to do it. The answer is we're all going to do it. Anyone who wants to do it. We're not trying to create a movement where there's a singular charismatic black male leader anymore. Martin Luther, I always call him Martin Luther King. <laughs> Martin Luther King was not there of his own accord. There were a lot of sisters that made him possible. My God. Right? And so the tendency in this moment is to make this movement about where the brothers that are going to lead us. When his sister's standing on the front line organizing the protests, facing down the cops, and still taking care of communities. 
And so then the thing that happens is people want to call you for news stories. They want to put you on TV because you're in the movement. And they want to talk to you. And see, that, that can become sexy because you're like, ooh, I'm going to be on TV. And when you're off in school doing protest work and your folks are at home working hard every day, TV feels like a legitimizer because they're like, well, we understand what our odd child is away doing. <laughs> right? In my family, that's certainly true. They're like, we don't know why it took you so long to get out of school. And we don't ever know what you're talking about, but we see you on TV and you're real pretty. <laughs> so on TV, and we call our friends and say, hey, she's on TV, come watch her. So then that, and then they call each, and then they text me and they say, well, what were you talking about on TV? You sound, it sounded real good. Like, those are my folks, they're working class people, right? So you feel like it makes you legitimate. But the problem is that folks can mistake getting on TV or getting to meet with the president as the end goal of the work. Mm -hmm. The end goal is freedom and liberty and revolution. It's not getting a seat with the president. It's not getting on TV. It's not getting on the radio. It's not getting your name in the paper, which we call the internet now. <laughs> it's, that's not the goal. And so we really got to resist the lure of celebrity. Right? And part of it is we got to do our own psychological work. What are you in this for? Right? What are you, are you in it for money? Because there's some money that can come. People love to have angry black folks come around and scream at them. White people actually are like gluttons for punishment about this. Like, liberal white people do this. They're like, come, angry person, and do it. <laughs> and they'll pay you a lot of money to do it. They'll give you a lot of clicks to do it. I've been doing this work a good minute. They'll give you a lot of clicks on the internet. When black feminists just want to spend time going after white feminists, which is sometimes fun to do with white feminists and things that are not right, people love it. They'll give you way more clicks for that than anything else. It makes you reactionary. It saps all your energy. I don't have energy to just be getting mad at white folks every day. Right? Because that clouds me from the work of trying to build the world I want to see. Right? And so you got to be very clear about what you're in it for. And if you're in it for celebrity, you ain't down for the cause. And we don't need you. Right? So you go do that and leave folk alone so they can work. I'm saying that because those are things we have to work on when we do organizing in New York and New Jersey. So we got lots of dynamic people who are asked to write all the time. And so we have to be very clear about what we're using our platforms for. And it ain't, exploit, it ain't to exploit people, right? And it's not to exploit the movement, because that movement is built on real lives and shed blood and mama's tears and communities that are hurting because people they love aren't coming home. And so how dare we pimp it for celebrities? I won't do that, and neither should you. So here's, here's a, a, a sort of question that I want to get to, and, and I'm rushing to a close. What's the place of pleasure and joy and love and hope and movement with? Because this shit is taxing. Yes. Deeply. It's hard to stare down black death every day and black pain every day and try to wrest some kind of power from a system that is really bent on taking it and be okay. And so part of the revolution has to be about joy. Right? See, justice without pleasure is not liberation. Justice without love is not liberation. And we, we, we forget that because our humanity has lived somewhere in between the continual quest for justice and just the quest to be as people in the fullness of the human experience. Uh, and that's important to say. It's important for black activist folk to give each other permission to like turn down a little bit, right? So one of the things we do uh, in New York, we throw what we call Big Black Brunch, uh, where we just get together and we eat and we drink. And we dance, you know, it's ratchet shit. It's like, <laughs> it's because all the time we see each other, we're working. Usually we see each other at protest or we're doing stories or we're working. And so it's important for us to say, like, we can't work all the time. Like, in the midst of revolutions, people love and they live and they eat and they cook and they sleep, to, you know, they sleep and they have sex and they do, they pay bills and they tend to children. They do all the things, and some of that can get lost because we get a singular focus on creating a new world. 
and revolutionary folks die young because of that. So we've got to ask that question too, which is why I wanted to call this series of talks the pleasures of resistance. So what's the place of pleasure, joy, love, and hope? And ha have we made space beyond critique? Right, because particularly for academics, all y'all are here learning is how to critique shit. What's wrong with it? What didn't they say? What didn't they do? What needs have what are gaps? <laughs> really? I mean, really, particularly grad students, that's all you learn. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And in my graduate course, I'm always like, you won't rip this book apart until you write a book. So first, we go figure out what this book did well. Because how dare you rip this book? You've written no book. You have not written a book. <laughs> so what you're, we're going to figure out what it does well. Then we're going to figure out what to say about it, that it could have done better. Right? And so it's a critical shift in that reorientation that's very important and very healthy, right? What we build is far more fundamental than what we tear down. And that's not a thing you hear a lot in academic spaces or activist spaces. We want a better world so much that we are always looking for the problems. And the problem is when that lens is turned on us, we can't live up to that kind of standard, right? So part of the reason we have so much anxiety about doing our own work is because we go for other people's work so hard that we know that if we were to held to that same level of scrutiny, we couldn't survive it which is why we should perhaps have a more critically generous standard. My, my friend Treva Lindsay calls it a, an ethic of critical generosity. And we need it when it comes to getting our language right, struggling with how to be good allies in racial justice movements and gender and sexual justice movements. Does the critical stance we force others and ourselves to inhabit feel livable, doable, possible, and joyous? Or does it merely feel like a chore? I mean, part of the reason that I'm saying this really is because Beyonce. Um, I think a lot about Beyonce because I like her. I think she's interesting. Um, and now that she vocally and visibly identifies as a feminist, I have never seen somebody get black women all up in the feelings like Beyonce identifying as a feminist. Black women are rough. They rubbing in everybody. So they're like, what? No, you can't sit with us, Beyonce. It's like the black woman saying for radical black women. They're like, you can't sit at our table if you're not radical enough, Beyonce. And I'm like, come sit at my table. <laughs> right, like, you know. So I find joy in her music, and it gives me permission and a soundtrack to be ratchet and sexy and contemplative and madly in love and unbossed and unbothered, too through, ready to fight, loving up on a partner or a lover or loving up on my homegirl. For all the many things that we insist she gets wrong, her music is a sonic invitation into full articulation. It doesn't achieve full articulation. That's not really what I'm trying to say. Uh, it doesn't have to. It invites us into a world that exceeds and frankly sometimes deliberately fucks with our critiques. A world of feeling and sociality and kinship and pleasurable forms of affect. And despite our desire to dismiss her, she beckons us into some kind of conversation with her and with each other and she is not the only one. She is merely one of the most fun. So one of the things I do on Tuesday nights, I did this last night, is I gather with my homegirls on Twitter, and we watch all the black women shows. So um, when Tuesdays is Being Mary Jane, tonight is Empire, tomorrow is Scandal, and sometimes How to Get Away with Murder, although I just, I just can't quite yet, but I like Viola. Those are scopic invitations into full articulation. Uh, and in these spaces, we convene what Jacqueline Bobo has called a black woman's interpretive community where we make sense of what we're hearing and seeing and what we are sensing and what memories are being conjured and what longings are being stirred. These are just some of the places where black women get to imagine what the world could be different, that the world could be different than it is, even as we are affirmed in some of the ways that the world is for us because we see it being lived and struggled with in one form or another on screen. These moments of escape, of respite, of critical generosity, of interpretation, of cutting up and clowning and joking, of doing what my friend Kyla Story does, Dr. Kyla Story, making these outrageous memes, which are like, you know, you just on the floor rolling. She's a gift for it. Um, as the biofuel of a healthy resistance and resilience. And as we struggle to make meaning together out of these visual and sonic texts, we are, I like to say, reassembling our pet perpetually disassembled selves and we are putting each other back together again. 
So I wonder too whether there is joy in struggle because I, I know that when I came back from Ferguson after 40 hours on a, on a terrible bus with my people, um, that I felt a kind of euphoria. Um, mm. Mm. We wept over the place where Mike Brown lay. Mm -hmm. We met with people in the community. We chanted some Asada Shakur. We, we have a duty to fight for freedom. Have you heard this chant? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We laughed and joked and strategized and there was joy. The best way I can describe it to you is the way it was taught to me as a Southern girl growing up in the Black Baptist Church. Because when I'm, and I'm going to um, use that frame just a little bit here. Um, because when I'm describing joy, I'm not talking about happiness. The pursuit of happiness is its own kind of social configuration that I think systematically eludes, I wasn't mean, meaning to go there just yet, but let me stay here. Um, which systematically eludes more and more Americans because it is tied to the crassest forms of material acquisition and the desire to feel secure in a world where we don't get to control very much. So much of a modern conception of happiness is rooted in what Lauren Berlant calls cruel optimism, which she describes as a relation of attachment to compromised conditions of possibility. A good example of this is a story out of Detroit a couple of weeks ago about a black man who walked 21 miles to work every day uh, and has done so every day for over a decade because he didn't make enough to afford a car. So rather than leading to a structural critique about the lack of living wage or the social inequality that structures public transportation in Detroit or the politics of space that makes jobs inaccessible for those in the inner city, instead this became a feel-good story about the virtues of working hard, <laughs> about the necessity of human charity. These are not the kind of critical possibilities that the Black Lives Matter movement is fighting for. That is the cruelest form of optimism, and we must reject it. So I'm not talking about what Sarah Ahmed calls happy objects or what Berlant calls cruel optimism. I want to park my pen at joy. Joy, as I've heard countless black preachers say, including my dad, is different than happiness, and that happiness is predicated on happenings, on what's occurring, on whether your life is going right, whether all is well. Joy arises from an internal clarity and assurance about our inherent value and worth and right to be here about the notion that our being has purpose and that tied up in that sense of value and worth is a kind of joy in fighting to create a world where those people whom we get to love, whom we are, get to live and thrive. It's best summed up for me in this Bible person. This is my overt gesture toward the sermonic, which matters here for me both because we must recognize spirit as a revolutionary resource, particularly among people of color groups. And sometimes when we go out into the world and seek to do work in communities of color, Various communities of color, particularly black communities, are spiritual in some way. And then we bring our secular frames, and they're like not trying to hear us. Right? And so maybe what we can do is begin to think about spirit as resource, and we can define spirit in all the ways we might define it. Right? That doesn't have to be God or religion. But it does have to reflect. Like, look, there's a, like, for black folks to keep getting up every day and fighting in these kind of conditions, there's something spiritual about that. That cannot merely be understood through the material. It does not understood through crass materialism very well, right? Not in my estimation. And so I think it's important to talk about what it means if we're talking about building a movement, how do we respect spirit even if that ain't the perspective that we coming from, right? So this Bible verse says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It's an odd turn of phrase right there at the end uh, that I think points us to what Bernice Johnson Reagan might term, throwing ourselves into the future. In other words, we must name and confront and dismantle the necropolitical death-dealing structures of power that currently shape our early 21st century black lives. And we must acknowledge all the ways death is at work within us. But in our movement work, in our building, in our showing up, and in our intentional forms of joyful living, we must wrest power from death. And we must turn destruction on its head. For though these structures attempt to destroy us, the victory is that when we keep waking up, standing up, and fighting, we will destroy them. Yes. We will overcome them. We will take power from the death working in our generation so that we may give life to the next generation. That's how I understand spirit as resource, as opposed to theological um, 
tyranny, right, or demand, right, for belief. In shorter form, the black church folk of my youth would say joy. The world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. And sometimes I think by world they were signifying on white folks without saying it. <laughs> right? So then, maintaining the capacity for joy is critical to the struggle for justice. It is critical in reinvigorating our capacity for new visions. Because if we arrive at the place of justice with no joy, it will soon become a place of injustice, innervated by our own dis diminished capacity for self-love and self-valuing, and therefore our own diminished capacity for empathy. So what then, and finally, is the place of love? And so many thinkers end up at love, right? Toni Morrison does, Cornel West does. It's an odd move, always, right? But I want to answer the question like I answered it when I asked it two years ago in Crunk Feminist Collective. I don't know how we politically operationalize love in social justice movements. Mm -hmm. But I do know love brings us back to the table when we would otherwise walk away. Mm -hmm. Love requires us to step in palms up when we would rather go out guns blazing. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about among our own people, not among the enemy, right? And I'm not suggesting you get your guns, but I am saying <laughs> you don't have to go in passive with your enemy, but with your people who sometimes trip, <laughs> and they do, right? Y'all know movement spaces can be a hot mess. Right? Just like academic spaces can, because those of us who do social justice work in either of those spaces come to them out of our own sense of trauma. Sometimes it's the only therapy we've had. I encourage us to start a movement therapy fund. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Love is life-giving. War is death-dealing. And I also know today that good love, good healthy love, is breath. Right? So we must love because love is breath. <coughs> nope. And so I just, I want to talk to them. So I met them. <coughs> I was in Ferguson, now they're married. We must love because love is breath, and we can't live if we can't breathe. Thank you. <laughs>
have more responsibility to treat people justly, and the state does. They give you a gun and they say that under certain, if certain conditions are met, you have the right to enact legal violence, I mean lethal forms of violence. That means that you're held to a higher responsibility than ordinary independent citizens. The social contract is we're, give, we're conceding some of our power to you. We're entrusting you to use that power justly. So police only want to think of themselves as ordinary citizens when it comes to being called out. But every other day it's like, respect me, I'm the police. No. Either you, if you're the police all the time, that means you get the responsibility that comes with being an officer. Right? So, I mean, the other thing I would say to them is just on a more crude point is, so, you're, so basically what you're saying to me is that you want me to tr think of you the same way that I think of thugs in the community that harm people. So you're just saying you just like regular old thugs. The police. If you want to concede that, cool, I agree with you. Right? But if you don't, then you need better arguments, which I'm prone to say to people, right? Yeah. Is there any perspective on reducing the sizes of police forces? Because it seems like if you say you're not, you don't really understand what police bring to your safety personally, mm -hmm. it's like not allowed to say. You know, everybody's got to be pro law and order, pro law police. And I was just thinking that I don't know how the police have ever helped me in my whole life. We were burglarized six times, never got anything. Speeding tickets, yeah, but that's not, that's like a gotcha. And I did have that experience, you said you reminded me. I asked for a warning, you know, like, oh, can you give me a warning? That guy got so mad, I had to get so obsequious, apologizing, like, I'm so sorry, you insulted me. And I was like, whoa. I always ask for something. I'm in sales. How could I not ask for more? <laughs> I mean, so anyway, I just, I don't understand. It's like a knee-jerk pro-police. I mean, there are two problems. One is, yeah, I think that police forces should be reduced um, because I think that part of what happens is pumping more money into policing incentivizes them to find crime. Yeah. I mean, it's like what we learned in New York City when they when they uh, did work slowdown in December, right. and the crime rate crime rate was reduced drastically. Right. Right. <laughs> it was like they were like crime is down ninety percent. <laughs> right. Right. In December, because why? Because it turns out that what we mean by crime is how many people get arrested, and not how much actual crime is committed. So the city didn't fall apart. We were going along mightily. People were having a great time. Like what? When they were like, we're not, we're only, give, they said we're only giving essential summons. Right. Which means that 90% of what you do is non-essential. <laughs> that is so That's interesting. Point. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we can have that. I think part of the challenge is that lots of times black communities skew towards wanting more police. Yeah. That's what they say statistically. But what they're really trying to say is we want less violence. Right? I'm, you know, not to put the words in, in the mouths of folks in the communities, but I think that the, the meaning behind that is we want less violence, and we've been told that more police equals less violence, right? So I think what we have to do is disrupt the narrative that we, because one, we already know that's not what police mean, and two, how do we solve the problem of violence? And we solve that by not making our people exist in concentrated areas of poverty with limited access to resources, right? And so we will address those problems, then we will address our crime problem, but then we would need less police. And you know, the police lobby is huge mm -hmm. and powerful. Yep. What else? Yes. Um, I really appreciate how you spoke about being more <coughs> inclusive, right, and having a more inclusive framework. Mm -hmm. I work with Latino youth in Madison, and a conversation that we've had this week, even though it's been really painful, is you know, um, what about Latino youth being killed as well? Um, and how are we part of that conversation? Right, without going towards that all lives matter um, mm -hmm. framework mm -hmm. and kind of, so yeah, it's been a really, I think um, it's pushed me to think about that, um, but that's something that I know you here are thinking about mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, I think um, it's a set of important conversations and I think um, we, we got to think in terms of solidarities. Mm -hmm. So part of the thing is recognizing like so I think sometimes there's a conversation that happens among people of color where when, when black folks are very visible in these social justice movements, it is translated as, see, we don't have that level of visibility and look at all the visibility that black folks have, right? And that visibility is translated as privilege, but it's not privilege, right? So one, it's translated as privilege, but it's like 
But what we're doing is we're getting in the streets demanding that you prosecute people who've killed us. And so when we expend all that energy and you still don't prosecute anybody and you don't change any policies and the person is still dead, then what have we really gained from our visibility? Nothing, right? The other thing is that that visibility is seen as, therefore, making other groups invisible. And what I want to always suggest to other peoples of color is white supremacy does that, right? White supremacy does that, not black folks, right? Um, and so I just completed this special issue of this journal uh, with one of my Asian American colleagues out at Berkeley uh, called Hacking the Black-White Binary. That was our attempt to think about like black-white binary racial frameworks um, in a world where we are increasingly a Latino population, where we have a significant Asian American population, Asian Pacific Islander population, et cetera, uh, and you know, and where we, and also indigenous folks, right? And so how do you think about the American racial schema um, with all of those lives in mind? Um, and what I want to say is I think it's tough. Because for me, I do think that our racial conversation in this country is primarily framed by black-white discourse. I do. Uh, and I think that when you find, like, I think that when you think about social movements around racial justice that have come afterwards, they are largely have some of the media and tools they have because of organizing done by black folks. So I always wonder why it makes people feel some type of way to have to give black people credit for theorizing social justice movements around racial equality. Um, so there's that. But, I mean, and I think that we have to think about anti-blackness is in here in all kinds of places, but in my work with black communities, you know, part of what we're saying is, look, like, we're not going to be anti-Latino, right? Like, we're not going to be anti-Asian, and so critiquing that. But I want other peoples of color to have a real conversation about the, the extent of their anti-blackness. Because part of what it means to be in America, be an American either because your folks have been here for generations, as many Latino and Asian folks have, or to be uh, newly, in a, newly in the US, whether you're African, an African immigrant or another kind of immigrant, is that, um, is that being anti-black is like the, the way to scale towards whiteness, mm -hmm. right? And so folks don't want to acknowledge that, but then want to talk about how the focus on black lives takes, um, takes something away from the focus on other lives. And for me, I just think like, we see white supremacy showing up to suppress all, kind, all peoples of color, right? And so we got to think about that as solidarity and coalition building. And I do think black lives matter folks are going to be like, look, we, part of our way of coming to the table with you is for you to acknowledge that we've been doing this work forever and that we have created a framework for it. And I think when that is forthrightly acknowledged, then we're like, yeah, like we see the connections, let's do it, right? Um, so I think it's really tough. Um, and I think we're gonna really have to figure out in particular black Latino solidarities. I think it's gonna be the coming couple of decades worth of conversations. I think it's gonna be really tough. Um, but I don't think we're gonna make it <laughs> through the browning of America unless we figure it out. Um, and, and the thing that makes it insidious is, I think, um, last thing I'll say is, but I think that that's how white supremacy wants it, is for us to always be arguing with each other rather than like consolidating energies to like dismantle white supremacy. Right? Um, so, so I'm not, excuse me, I'm not interested in arguing over resources or platforms, you know, like. I mean, so my model for this, though, is um, the Dream Defenders in Florida. So when they came together, then they had a huge strategy meeting with the Dreamers, right, and with um, Native organizers there and said, okay, this place is terrible. Like, what, you know, how can we support each other's movements? And they built that into their framework from the very beginning, and that work has continued. And so I think all of us have to take their lead on in that regard, and that there have to be these meetings where we say, all right, here are these movements for racial justice. How, how, where are the linkages? And how can we show up to each other's stuff and support? I do think that that's happening with young people, and I think it just has to become more visible. Yeah. What else? Yes. <clears throat> I very much liked in your response to the question about uh, over-policing, the emphasis that uh, changing basically the class structure is what's needed for a solution, mm -hmm. rather than increasing uh, policing. Yeah. In the Black Lives Matter mo emerging movement, how much awareness of sort of capitalism and class 
and socialism as these older ways we've talked about system transformation, how much is that also emerging? You know, Martin Luther King at the end of his life was beginning to sound more like a socialist, uh, but then that current pretty much got marginalized everywhere, not just, of course, in the racial justice movement. Yes. Is, there, is there an anti-capitalist thread Absolutely. We're trying to build an anti-capitalist, anti-white supremacist, anti-heteropatriarchal anti movement. Like, the, that's the, you know, that's the general refrain. So I think people, I mean, absolutely do have a critique of capitalism. We certainly do, and so part of it is like talking about not branding the movement. I mean, it's one of the reasons that we're trying to resist the lure of celebrity, which is ultimately about money and ultimately about getting rich because we feel like that's sort of being sucked into that structure. Um, and so I think it's still developing. Um, I think that we also have to figure out, like, you know, we're not old school Marxists in the sense that, um, Part of what happens is like anytime we have rallies, like communist folks come to the rallies and they're like, we want to talk, you know, we're always like, what's your race analysis like though, right? Because when, when I look at class stuff, what we find is that controlling for class, there's still racial disparities, right? And so I don't find that a traditional Marxist analysis really works with that and that Marxist and communist folk and socialist folk are very good on that question. They always think race is, is um, subsumed under class, and this movement is not going to concede that. We're just not going to concede. I don't, that's not my analysis. So my analysis is an anti-capitalist, uh, anti-patriarchal, anti-white supremacist analysis, uh, but, but I, don't think that, I don't think that merely shifting the class structure solves the problem of racism. So, I, so but, I, but I do think, um, like, we don't spend a lot of time talking about class, but in regular conversation, our desire to resist, like, I think all of us sort of just say to each other, like, so you know we're not capitalists, right? Like, this is, like, that's <laughs> And we're not trying to do that, right? And so when things look very capitalist to us, we, we think about that. But the other challenge is, we're also like, we gotta eat, though, right? And when you're talking about folks who, like, I think that Niall, who just, got into like a couple PhD programs at the Ivies, lives in the projects in Newark. Like the, the organizer I was citing, like he, you know, he just got into a PhD program at Columbia and one at Princeton. But right now he lives in the projects in Newark, which is very much the kind of life. And Newark is, I mean, they call it Brick City for me, like it's not for the faint of heart. So when, so those, those kind of competing realities, like I'd be like, dude, I'm not a capitalist, but like, if you can't tell me some shit about how to take care of my family where folks are still on food stamps, then it's hard for me to hear fully your critique. Because, you know, because sometimes folks call me elitist or whatever and because I'm a professor. And I just be like, yeah, but like black women professors, like our, pay, our one paycheck that's a professor paycheck goes to support like whole yes. families of people. Speak. You know? And so I sometimes feel like when I meet like, cat, like, hardcore socialists, like, they don't, be try they don't really think about that. They're just like, this, this structure needs to change. And I'm like, yes. But right now, I'm about to like, you know, as a single black person, black woman with no kids, I'm like, so the government is going gon is gon to treat me like I'm a socialist because they're going to take, you know, 40% of my check. Right. And then after they take that 40%, then I'm going to go share it with all these other people in the family and there's no accounting in the tax structure for that. Right? Um, and so whenever I, I get a check, I just be like, I'm a, I'm a Democrat, like as this goes, I'm a, like, I'm always like, I'm on the left, right? I'm liberal, I believe in like a robust public whatever. <laughs> I had to remind myself, right? Because I'm like, something is very fundamentally unjust about who pays what into the system. So it ain't about political proclivities, but sometimes like, how everybody gonna eat? with this one limited set of resources, and I don't think we always talk about that. So those are some humps I think we have to get over, but I do think people are very amenable to the analysis. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And you and then you, okay? Me? Yes. Uh, so can I, um, can I push that question just a little bit further? Mm -hmm. um, when I was listening to your talk, um, it, it, which I loved, but um, uh, it, it didn't resonate so much with socialist critique for me as with anarchist critique. Mm -hmm. um, the structures that you're describing for organization are very bottom up, they're mm -hmm. very localized mm -hmm. in terms of the way that you're um, describing um, decision making structures, analysis of problems, 
the problems of organizing and the affective problems of organizing, also the kind of very Spinozist uh, uh, sensibilities about joy mm -hmm. as something that, which is about power and mm -hmm. empowerment, mm -hmm. um, and it's something that gets struggled over. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the opposite of which is sadness, mm -hmm. which is something that we struggle against. Mm -hmm. Uh, all of it sounds very, uh, very anarchist in ter in ter or anarcho-communist in terms of its uh, sensibilities, mm -hmm. um, which I know there's there's a presence of that in Ferguson and other sort of mobilizations as well. Is yeah. that? Yeah, it does. I mean, look, I think that there are some real places for solidarity. Like, um, frankly, anarchy has a PR problem in that it mostly seems like um, <laughs> does, yeah. white boys. <laughs> <laughs> who don't have the same political stakes, right? Who their sort of cause for anarchy won't cost them the same thing, right, as, it, as they cost us. So when I've seen anarchists come out to protest, they just showing out real bad, but it's like in a way that's gonna endanger other people who are there, which is why people aren't trying to hear it. Cause it's like, what, what do you want now? Um, Cause why are you yelling that shit at the police like that, right? Like we all agree that they're terrible and should go, but you're gonna get us killed? And I mean, because you know, when I did protest in New York over Trayvon Martin, like anarchists were there, occupiers and anarchists, right? Are like they're like fucked up, you know? And we're like, dude, we just trying to walk. We just trying to. Walk. <laughs> what you want? What are you doing? Like, and so this is the so there is an you know sort of affective presentation that happens in movement space where folks are like, mm, mm, they not our people, because until anarchy really attends to the white privilege problem and the white supremacy problem and like how your framework gonna help black people get free uh, in a set of, like tearing down the structure. See, here's the challenge. It feels like tearing down the structure. I don't know that we believe that it's just tearing down the structure unless you call it out. Like if the structure is just the state apparatus because it's a top down apparatus, that's one thing. But that top down apparatus is that way because we believe that there are hierarchies of people. And that's rooted in racism and patriarchy, right? So even if you agree the system is jacked up, if you don't actually change the ideology that builds the need for that system, right, then when you rebuild a new system, whatever it is, without transforming those ideologies, you don't do anything. I think that's part of it, is that there's not the sense, because like I have one of my, a good friend who's like, she's like, I'm sort of an anarchist except where I'm not, where she's a black woman. You know? So she's like, I'm, you know, she's like, I sort of, tend towards anarchy on things, but you know, their racial analysis isn't quite right and their patriarchy analysis isn't quite right. And so I just don't know how black women are gonna fare out if we follow an anarchist plan, an anarchist plan. So in other words, we're still thinking a lot about material embodiment and what does it have what does it look like after we build after we destroy shit. <laughs> right? Because in some ways we're like, what, what upon what basis will people build a new stuff? And so, you know, so I think the solidarity could be like, maybe we do go far enough to be like, we want to tear it all down. But when it comes to the rebuilding, people might be looking at you with the side eye. I like, well, don't know. So, I mean, that, and that's, you know, anarchy is not my depth. It's a thing I should think about more. But, but I do recognize the resonances for sure. And I do think that there are folks who have affinities. And I think the other thing I really want to say is like, even though it like, makes people upset, like particularly old head, old civil rights folks who are like, we want to support you young people, we don't totally know what you're doing, <laughs> right? You don't totally get it, it's like real angry and like you don't have any leaders and you don't have a plan and y'all just go out in the street. And I think the thing is like, um, there are going to be a lot of iterations of this before it's all said and done. And we keep on being like, we're decentralized. Like, we don't, because we, local communities need to be able to figure out what works for them. And what we want to do is like share frameworks where they work and not impose those frameworks where they don't. And we don't want a charismatic leader. We don't want people to be able to say, there, there's the new Martin Luther the King. Like, we don't want that. You know, we really don't want that. I mean, I'm working right here. So you kind of touched on a point that I wanted to bring up. So there's sort of thoughts. You know, there's this black academic approach to the Black Lives Matter, and, mm -hmm. well, any movement and mm -hmm. any racial uh, group. And then there's the folks that aren't sort of in the academic space. Mm -hmm. And there's a bit of a gap between those two. Right. How do you perceive that gap? And also, how do you see trying to bridge that gap? Right. I mean, 
Alicia, Patrice, Alicia, and Opal are full-time organizers. They're not academics. Um, so they, they've gotten their work because they work in communities doing organizing with domestic workers. Um, Opal heads the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, which is about immigration policy, and then Patrice does things, but they're not academics. Um, so yeah, I think there's a gap. I think some of the gap is some of the gap feels false in the sense that, you know, when I got on the bus and went to Ferguson, I think I was like one of two professors on the bus. Now, most folks had most folks were very well educated, but they weren't they weren't professors, right? They were preachers. A lot of them were randomly preachers, but I didn't know. Odd, but they were preachers and activists, artists. You know, like we took a heal, you know, so I don't know, like we took a team of healers with us to Ferguson who like, do, who do somatic healing and body work. So Reiki and, you know, tarot and uh, acupuncture, screen therapy. Like I think we're trying to think in all the iterations about how this works. But I do think there's some tension. Um, all I can tell you is the younger folks who are in the movement really are, like for me as one of those people, um, I think, um, I'm always trying to break down that barrier between the academic and the activist and, you know, in saying to folks like, academia is my day job, it's my career and I love it, but like if black folks can't live, this career doesn't matter. So I will also be in the street. Um, I, but I think one of the tensions I hear is around language and around frameworks. So everyday black folks are just like, black men are getting killed, this must stop. And then the more academic stuff is like, what are we gonna do about cisgender privilege, right? <laughs> And people are like, who the, do what about who now? <laughs> what's, that, what's that word? <laughs> but I think the thing we, you know, we just have to remember is like, but black folks have a, a long history of being really humane. Also really violent towards queer folks, trans folks, but not more than any other group. And I think um, there was a great moment when one of the Ferguson organizers she came to New York for an event we had. Uh, we were sitting in a room with Janet Mock, who's a trans uh, activist. Uh, and so she was like, well, Janet was talking about her book. And so she was like, well, tell me about your book, Janet. So Janet was like, Brittany, tell her about my book. So I was like, ah, our book is about black girlhood and womanhood and her, uh, you know, her journey as a trans uh, woman. And she was like, trans? You're trans? I couldn't tell. And I was like, girl, you can't say that. <laughs> what are you talking about? Right? And then, so, Jan you know, because Janet was like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, you know? Um, and then, but the thing she said to me was so profound. This was December. She said, I didn't, she said, I'm really sorry. I, I wasn't trying to be, you know, whatever type of way. She was like, the first time I heard the term trans was in August when y'all came to Ferguson. Right? And it was a great moment for me because I was like, right. So it wasn't that she was, she, if you give her the language, she won't be transphobic, right? So it's not even an antagonism towards trans people. It's like, literally, I have never heard this language before. So she's like, I'm invested in black people getting free. But if I, no one, you know, and, and so then I said to somebody this week, like, who was calling some people transphobic, I was like, tell me where they would get access to the language of cisgender anything. Because I heard that language after grad school. And I went to a place with a top women's and gender studies PhD program, and I work in a place with a top women's and gender studies PhD program, and I didn't hear that language till 2010. You know, and I heard it because one of the crunk feminist collective members was usually, and I was like emailing her like, I know that you're not supposed to have to teach me about this, but what <laughs> does that mean? Like, you know? And so even knowing the posture to go to her, and she's not trans identified, but queer masculine center, and so even having to go to her and say, I as a, you know, hetero, cis person need you to teach me this thing. Like, I didn't know enough to know, like, it's not her labor to do, but I was like, I don't know where else to learn, right? right? And so we got to figure that part out too. Because sometimes then we go and be like, we don't like the way that these everyday folks talk about this. We don't, and you know, we had this um, sanctimony, like we don't believe that they really had the analysis to get free. But if, if it were based on analysis, we wouldn't have any movement in the streets. We would still be sitting in the, being like, I need to read this book on social movement. <laughs> and then, you know, we can think about what's happening to our people. And they're like, fuck that, we turning up. So, you know, so one of the organizers, like part of the way this happened, which wasn't on the news, was the first night that this happened in Ferguson, the cop cars came, but by nine o'clock, so many people had gathered that they pushed the cops out of the neighborhood. They like, the cops went running, which no one is, you know, and so the folks over there were like, no. We were so turned up that they like left, right? 
And we wouldn't have been turned up like that. We'd have been like, what? Let's go allies, what's right. happening? <laughs> so, so I think that they force us to stay honest. For me, they do. Like, you know, because it's real easy to stick your head in a book when folks is like dying. You like, because you, because here's the thing. I do think the work that I do is liberatory work. If I can get some white kids to be more thoughtful about white privilege and maybe not so violent with it, that's important work. Because I know that in some ways they're going to have more power than I can ever imagine. Right, when I taught at Embry and one of my kids came to class one time and he was like, you know, Ms. Cooper, I couldn't make it to class today because, you know, I own an apartment building. And I was like, you. You know. And so having a plumbing problem. And he wanted my sympathy about the plumbing problem. I was like, dude, I'm stuck back on you're 20 and you own this apartment building. So I'm like, what? So I know that they will have some power that I will just never have. And so I know if you can get them to think differently, you are doing really important work. But that's just not the only work there is to do. And sometimes we got to get out in the streets and put our bodies on the line and say, hell no, you know? Yes. Yeah, I wanted to kind of, and it's, it's ironic in the context uh, of the previous question, but get to the, some of the academic kinds of questions and the kind of what we learn from civil rights movement history. Mm -hmm. And I hear you making a really sharp distinction between the old movement and new movement, the young people, the old people. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's just out of my social position as old person, right? But when I, I think about the 60s and I think about the kinds of movements that people were involved in then, they were not all Martin Luther King or Malcolm X. There was an awful lot of grassroots learning to organize. And I think we've done a lot of learning about especially what black women did on the ground to build non-hierarchical organizations. And so I'm just wondering to what extent the new movement, the young movement, whatever, is actually trying to connect mm -hmm. with that other history of the old movement and mm -hmm. the old people who, I think, did some good stuff that has been theorized, too. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite books is uh, a thing by Francesca Poletta called Freedom is an Endless Meeting, mm -hmm. um, about the struggles of participatory democracy and mm -hmm. how hard it is. Mm -hmm to come to joint decisions, but how it can be taught. Right. Yeah. I mean, so a couple things. One is, in this movement, I'm old. The kids call me old. When we were on the bus to Ferguson, I'm 34. We're on the bus to Ferguson. The kids are coming to the back of the bus where I'm sitting. Tell us how it was when Rodney King happened. <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? I was nine. Like, I don't know. I mean, you know. <laughs> I saw a video and then I saw some cops get free and I don't know like but that you know for them they're like you know they're 23 and they're like we're young and you old people have you know abandoned us and I'm like dude what like so there's that um two I, you're absolutely right um so the analysis about being gender inclusive is entirely beholden to the work of black women in civil rights and black power um so Ella Baker is a person that's frequently cited Fannie Lou Hamer is someone that I really um, like both of them had this sort of radical political analysis about locating power in the hands of people and assuming that people could come to consensus of their own accord and didn't need leaders. Um, one of the things I said yesterday is that part of the reason I have a problem with King and I have a problem with that charismatic male model uh, is because Anna Arnold Hedgeman, who I write about in my book, um, you know, was sitting at the March on Washington and then in the memoir she wrote a year later, she said, look, my problem with King is that he said, I have a dream. Why didn't he say, we have a dream? Right? Like all these years we've heard, I have a dream, but it wasn't ever, it wasn't just his dream. Um, so yes, I think, um, I'd say to people in movement spaces a lot whenever I'm doing teaching work, we have to learn the lessons of the 60s. And for me, the key lesson um, is that what we won't do is make the women do the grunt work and all of the labor like Belinda Robinette calls bridge building, bridge leadership, right? Um, and not do, uh, you know, not sort of be out front articulating a basis for the movement. Um, so yes, I, so my own thinking um, is deeply beholden to um, all those women. And I do see them as people who theorize leadership and who mm -hmm. theorize movement building. Um, and you know, so, you know, I mean, I think, I mean, I write about somebody like Polly Murray as well, who wasn't really here for black power because she said, look, it just looks like 
she called them the apostles of black consciousness and that was derisive and you know she said look this just looks like another bid for mass uh, for black, for masculinity on par with white patriarchy and and you know and I don't support that um, so and you know and, and Tony K Bombar too I mean as a person who had one of the most you know sort of uh, forthright critiques of Stokely Carmichael right the only position for a woman in the revolution is prone he said and you know she was the person who called him out for that rhetoric um, but that's why we know to foreground women. And that's why we keep on challenging these guys when they're like, we want to be on the mic because we got something to say. See, and this is the challenge, right? I think young folks want to be on the mic because finally somebody's listening. And so we really have to get them to see, like, but there's political cost and we got to do it right at the beginning. Right? Um, and, you know, so yeah, so we got to do it right at the beginning. And if, I think if they get that, so like one of the people I think is good on this is Philip Agnew. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he if he speaks, he brings another woman. They speak together. If you know, if they can bring a couple of people, you know, he has that sort of analysis. Folks like Nile, a lot of the guys we work with in Black Lives Matter, um, won't come up on stage by themselves. They want to share the stage with women. Uh, they will not be on panels if they're called. If they're not, if there's not enough female representation or enough queer representation. Um, I think what we have to go beyond the 60s and 70s is around the question of sexualities and gender identity. Um, you know, because one of the things I read about is, you know, part of Polly Murray's struggle in movement building was that in today's terms she probably at some point would have been trans identified and she has to curtail some of that in order to be a certain kind of leader. Um, so we're working really hard to, to foreground trans women as leaders. But, yeah. So, yeah, I, I think we got to learn the lessons of the 60s, so I appreciate it. So I'm conscious of over-exploiting you, but there is a question from somebody from Young, Gifted, and Black, and maybe she can get the last comment or question. Okay. Hello, Brittany. Thank you so much. This was just, I needed this, so thank you. Thank you. So I have a question. Um, not too long ago, a few days ago, we had about 2,500 kids come to the Capitol and show out. We didn't have, they came. Mm -hmm. They came and they showed out. And so my initial question was like, yeah, how do we like get their analysis like deeper? Like, this is a movement moment and we need to like, if the t tension is here, but like their analysis is here. So how do we meet that? But I think that you're absolutely right in thinking about what we've done and what's been done in the past. How do we get out the way and allow them to like, do what they do, mm -hmm. but in a way that's really guiding and molding and not like YGB, this is us, we're the leaders, mm -hmm. but like how do we like pass the torch and really just educate and be examples for them to be leaders? Mm -hmm. Because it can really quickly become that I am the dream when yes, right. like we are the dream. So how do we, it's like, that seems like a, like a dog question, but like right. I'm struggling. You know, I, you know, I struggle with this too in the sense that on the one hand, so I think we see ourselves as resources to places, right? Because like all that happened when, when, when the folks, when the BLM folks in New York found out I was coming to Madison, they was like, you know, sis, what resources you need? Like find out what resources they need. Like just let us know how we can support. I think that's the language and the posture. Mm -hmm. But look, here's, here's the other thing too. And I say this is, you know, maybe it's because I'm like, you know, sometimes I was saying to those 23 year olds when they came to me in the back of the bus, I'm like, dude, it's not just your moment. Like all of us have been working for this moment our whole lives too. Like this is all of our moment, you know? Um, and I was like, just because I spent 10 years in school <laughs> doesn't mean, like, like, I'm ready now. Like, I'm down, you know? Um, so there's that. So I think we also, like, look, I think that what folks want is, like, we took a 17-year-old on a trip with us. Like, she was like, told her parents, I'm missing school and I'm going to Ferguson. And they came and they were like, here's our child. <laughs> Please don't let anything happen to our child, <laughs> you know? So we took her and she, you know, she's awesome. Um, I think... I, the thing I really want to say is, so I know that young folks, 17-year-olds, 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds, want to lead, and I think they can, but that doesn't mean that they do have all the resources and all the analysis. All of this time spent organizing, reading, thinking together is a set of resources and tools that we have that they don't have, right? And that's not a comment on whether they can get it or are interested. And so sometimes I think in our desire to not be hierarchical, we don't acknowledge that, like, but the extra years and the extra time of study and the experience actually does make a difference. The ch the, what we have to make sure of is that we don't <coughs> then crowd people out who are eager to get to work because we think we know more. But I think we do have to say to young folks like, you know, consider this, right? There are consequences if, if we don't consider this. So I think we have to see ourselves as resources to them. And I don't know, I don't know that I see it as getting out of the way. People say that and it, ne it never quite sits well with me. Um, 
I feel like what I want us to do is recognize that we all got a place here. We, we all need to be here. Um, and I don't always know how to hold that intention with like, I don't want to marginalize young people. This is their moment and it is about them. Um, but I don't think like being 25 or 30 means that, you, you know, that you're too old to contribute, you know, or that you don't have something to say. Like having an analysis about police brutality and reading studies and looking at the constitution and figuring all of that out is actually really important analysis that we need. So look, part of what I think young folks can do, I think they can have the analysis to some degree. I think that they're also the folks who are going to be out in the streets like we out here. We got energy. Because I'm like, I'm 34. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to come out here for an hour or two. <laughs> but I'm not going to be out here till 3 in the morning. Because I must pay bills. Until y'all take down the capitalist structure, I got to pay bills. <laughs> right? And so, you know, real talk. Like, I think we got to uh, sort of acknowledge some of our humanity in there and some of the tension. So I think you should, I, look, and I don't think going to them and saying we're YGB and we've been doing this work and we want to work with you, let us know if we can be of assistance, is the same thing as being like, we the leaders. I think you work your lane, right? And I think you recognize that they're building their own lane. And also that at some point they're going to come asking like, where do we get the analysis for X, Y, and Z? And then you show up and you be there. And then you give the analysis, you know? Because it's sort of like, when well, my students come to my classes, whether they're black students or white students or Latino students or whatever, it would be like me saying, well, y'all already, you know, y'all don't need me for this. Like, and it's like, but you do though. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I've actually studied this and you do like I've actually studied movements and it makes a difference. Um, and that sounds hierarchical. I just don't buy that. Right. Hierarchy says because you're 17, you can't do anything and you don't matter and your voice doesn't matter. For me, movement building says everybody has a place and our leaders are going to come from some unlikely places. And what we need to do is get behind these young folks and their vision and their courage, right? And then build them up. And we build them up with the analysis, right? And we build them up with the manpower we, and woman power, people power, right? We build them up by standing there with them and saying, we got your back. Um, and I find that when you respect young folks that way, they'll turn around and be like, how do I answer X question?" How do I do Y thing? And, then, and look, this is, and look, this might not be politic. It may be in politics. But if they don't and you see it costing something, I do think you tap them on the shoulder and call them in, not out. And you say, yo, like, not going to work out. So what you're going to need to do is X. And I'm saying that in love and I mean it. And they'll know you mean it because your other ethic is always about respect. Right? So when you have respect, when you need to call in and say, like, you need to tighten that up some, They'll, they'll hear you, right? That's, that's my sense of it. Um, I'm still working that out too, though, right? And I'm still working out. Every time they come to me and they're like, you know, treat me like I'm real old. <laughs> <laughs> like, what you talking about? You know? Like, I just, you know. So I'll be giving them the side <laughs> a little bit. But yeah, I think, I think what I got from them is that, that you know, they, they appreciate that we're down and we show up, and that means the world to them. Yeah. yeah.